Um, hi everyone, welcome to Pit Stop number 13. Um, today we're doing something a little interesting um, with Nuke and Andy here. Um, glad you guys could be on. And we're gonna be talking about something I've been, I've been thinking about um, for a while now, a couple of weeks, I'd say. Um, this idea of breaking the chain in passing on insecurities from parents to their children. Um, and where this idea kind of came from was starting to realize just as, you know, I dove more in um, to myself and also talking with other people that are doing a lot of the same work is kind of realizing just a lot of parents fuck their kids up, to be honest with you, right? Um, and, you know, our childhoods and the, the lessons that we, we learn from them really stick with us and affect us for in our, our entire lives. And a lot of times we spend a lot of our adult lives trying to unwind those lessons. Um, and so, yeah, and so this idea of breaking the chain of doing the work on yourself so that you don't pass these insecurities um, onto your children. And, um, you know, because I think there, a lot of them are insecurities or lessons or ideas that have been passed on generation to generation to generation, almost subconsciously, not really knowing um, why, or, you know, not, not looking into these, these things that we've learned and just accepting them as truths. Um, and so the first, the first point that I wanted to, to kind of go into a little bit with you guys is the idea of humanizing your parents. And this comes from uh, the conversation, well, one of the conversations in the Kings of Hearts, uh, you know, meetup that uh, we had a couple weeks ago on fatherhood, right? And the idea of realizing that your father is just a man, right? You know, you have this idea, um, when you're a child that, you know, your parents, they're superheroes, right? You know, they're the biggest, the strongest, the fastest, the smartest, the, the best in everything. And kind of taking a step back as you get older and realizing that they also have their shortcomings. Um, and so uh, I, I wanted to ask you guys first of just your experiences with um, either yourselves of, re you know, realizing that your parents are humans um, and not these superheroes or what you've seen in other people. So. <laughs> Nukes pointing at me. <laughs> I really love this uh, topic, Jared. I'm quite passionate about it. Um, and you know, one of the first things that come to my mind around the question you just asked is that we spent a lot of time, uh, a large portion of our childhood, placing our parents on a pedestal. And the, the thing is we transition, when we transition into adulthood, or at least myself, when I transitioned into adulthood, uh, there, was a, there was no like initiation, there was no conclusion to that pedestal. And so my mom stayed up there, uh, whether it was conscious or subconscious. And yeah, like a lot of it, a lot of her teachings, I would bring on myself and I would carry things on and I would take things personally uh, without even, without really looking at it for what it is and, and how my mom is like, what can we say, humanizing our parents. There was, uh, for me, there was, uh, there was a situation where my mom, she was dealing with a lot of anxiety and there was an issue uh, one time where she couldn't get any sleep and that she lost sleep for several nights and she's drinking a lot of water as a kind of like a substitute for sleep. She was drinking so much water uh, to the point where she flushed so much sodium out of her body, almost causing a seizure that sent her to the hospital. And while she was at the hospital, the doctors were talking to her more about her mental health. And I was there with her at the hospital the, the entire time with her beside her when they were talking to her about her mental health and that was the that was one of the defining moments for me where i looked at my mom and i was like oh wow she has anxiety she has severe anxiety and and there's a part of me where like i need to support her you know and it's it's really interesting because the roles felt a little bit reversed there for a second i was like i need to i need to be the lighthouse in her light in her life in this moment 
And that's when the uh, pedestal began to dissipate a little bit. And we sought help from my mom, from my mom. And so that, that's my experience with the humanization of our parents. One of many experiences, I should say. For sure. And, you know, like even that story, just highlighting how important a lot of times it can be. Of, um, you know, I feel like a lot of times parents think that they need to be, you know, these almost perfect representations for us. Right. But, you know, as you're saying of humanizing her a little bit, you know, realizing that she needed the support and then helping her get that support. I love that. What about you, New? Any Anything come to mind for humanizing your parents? Yeah. So thanks, Andy, for that beautiful share. And with, with my parents, I would definitely say <laughs> I realized probably like in junior high or maybe even like high school, just realizing like, wow, like my parents <laughs> are also flawed. <laughs> and I remember my mom one time I was going to do, I was going to misbehave and my mom caught me before I was going to do it. And I was like, how'd you know? And she was like, do you not, do you not think I was once a child? And like, it just clued into me like, wow. And I mean, like I'd seen pictures of them when they were small, but I never like clued into me. Like she was once a kid as well, who knew how to get in and out of trouble, who knew, like, you know what I mean? And in that moment I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> like you're real. <laughs> like you, like <laughs> your existence d didn't just begin when I was born, <laughs> you know? And, and, I, and in that moment I was like, okay, like you guys, you have your shortcomings, right? And, um, and I think the other thing that's super interesting is with, I think in the Western culture, having, having let, let's just say two parents raise a child, it puts that pressure that like, they need to have it all together, right? Versus I think, and I've even talked about like Andy with this, is like this idea of having community and it takes a village to raise a child. Like, to, like, I have no problems when I have kids being like, listen, I don't have an answer to that. Go talk to Uncle Andy. You know what I mean? I don't need to have an answer. I don't need to have it all together or be dad that knows it all. Or, you know what I mean? Or be dad that isn't scared. I'm like, man, I have no clue what kind of, what you're talking about. But I know Andy has some, you know, or Jared, Uncle Jerry knows exactly what you're talking about. He, he went through that. Go and hang out with him for an hour. Do you see what I'm saying? And I think that would then alleviate this pedestal ideology, right? That there's nothing wrong with, with, with kids doing that because it creates trust as someone to look up to. And Andy said it really well. When there's no like conscious transition or like ending of, not ending, but just realize that your parents are human and they have flaws and that they're real. That's my two cents. <laughs> Andy, do you have some? Yeah, as Nuke was uh, speaking, uh, it just, this thought kind of came down to me and I, it's a thought and also a question back at both of you guys actually. And the thought that I had was, the moment that we, we realize or come to a realization that our parents are just humans, I found for myself that I was a lot less, I was a lot, less hard on my mom. You know, when we pedestal people, we, we have high expectations for them. Mom's always been this way. Mom's always been the provider. Mom's always this or that, or dad's always this or that. And we, we put that pressure, as Nuka said, we put a lot of pressure on them, uh, whether they know it or not, whether we know it or not. And I was curious if you guys, when you realized that your parents were humans, do you feel that you're a lot less hard on them, even if it's in your own thoughts? Yeah, that, uh, that actually goes into something else I was going to say, too, of, you know, not using it as an excuse of like, oh, well, my parents, you know, made me this way, right? And really empathizing with them. And I think one of the biggest realizations was, um, you know, some people in my life that are around my age are starting to have kids. Right. And I look at it and I go, even for myself right now, I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Right. And so, you know, realizing that a lot of times, you know, parents are still finding their way through life and now they're presented with this child. And, you know, they, they can only do the best that they can do. Um, and so empathizing with that of, you know, they, 
they are doing the best that they know how, right? It's not like they're, they're, you know, doing these things to intentionally make things hard or to harm or whatever it might be. A lot of times in their mind, that is, um, you know, what, that's what they think is best and that's the way they think that they need to act, right? And so that, the, keeping that in mind has really helped me. Um, and, you know, something that I want to talk about a little bit later as well, but, you know, realizing that they also have the lessons that their parents taught them, right? And that their, their, their parents' parents taught them as well. And again, you know, a lot of those are passed down. And a lot of those lessons is, again, just, well, this is how it's supposed to be done. And so empathizing with that, of again, they're just doing the best that they can. Nuke, what about you? Jared, that was beautiful. Uh, yeah, you know, I think what helps for parents and for kids, and I'll speak for myself, what helped a lot was dad would always be like, listen, I don't have all the answers. He, he would say that full on. And, 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 and to this day, he'll even say, like, I've always educated my kids to go and seek answers and know that you can critique your mom and I just and obviously just be classy about it right so there have been times we've been like we disagree with that and it's like why and then and then we come with a thoughtful well-constructed you know what I mean or speaking your truth did we call it speaking your truth back then no but it was just you being honest and being sincere and, and having and having tone tact and timing right and so I think when not think. I believe when a parent can like can look at their child and be like, hey, like I don't have all the answers. However, let's figure it out together. It just again, like to me, like that's I just know moving forward. That's that's what I tell my kids. I do not have an answer to this. Let's 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 learn and figure it out together. You know, and and, and I and I hope in in those little moments that my kid will learn and see that dad doesn't have it all together either. And nobody does, regardless of your age, right? And so, yeah. Love that. And I, I think that takes a lot of courage, too, of mm -hmm. telling your child, I don't have the answer, right? And almost feeling like that's not the way it should be. Like, I'm their parent. I should know. I should be able to help them. And I think that's where a lot of even frustration comes out, right? Of sometimes, you know, it's, the answer is purely frustration or anger or um, whatever it might be because they don't want to give the answer of, I, I don't know, mm. right? or I haven't mastered this. I'm still struggling with this. So um, the next one is, I don't remember exactly where I heard, heard the, the phrase, but I really, it really stuck with me. And I think, again, it might've been that King of Hearts talk. Um, the idea of phrasing insecurities as drag right? And everyone needs to go out and slay their own dragons. And the idea that if you as a parent have not gone out and slayed some of your dragons, you now pass them on to your kid. And now they don't only have their own dragons, their own insecurities to slay, but they also have yours, right? Because everybody, in my opinion, has some sort of insecurity to some level of degree that they need to overcome. Um, you know, some are bigger, some are smaller, and it's a tough journey. And just that, that image of, well, now, not only do I have my own, but I also have my parents. And instead of my parents being there to help me slay my own dragons, they've added on to the work that I need to do. Um, just wondering if you guys have any thoughts on that. Yeah. That was from a Kings of Hearts events. I remember that. And you know what the, the scary thing about that, that whole concept of, is, is like the whole dragon slaying, is that a lot of people are slaying their parents' dragons without even knowing it's their parents' dragons. Literally, they think it's theirs. And so they look at what they have, the obstacle that they have in front of them, and there's this huge, massive, Thing to conquer uh, and it all feels like it's them it's their fault it's, I'm not good enough and 
yeah, I would say that a lot of, yeah, a lot of people are slaying their, their parents' dragons with, and without even knowing it's their parents, not even knowing. And, um, and I think that's what, that's why these conversations are so important. Uh, it invites people to reflect and start looking at their insecurities and asking themselves, okay, is this mine or is this someone else's? And I think that is such a great opening conversation for any type of emotional work is, is this mine or is this someone else? And I know New can speak to this as, uh, as like an empath or he has empath qualities and traits is that, you know, he, you know, something I've learned from Nuke is stop and ask, you know, this, or this grief that's coming up, is this even mine? Or this anger that's coming up or that trigger that I had, is this mine or is this someone else's? And it's such a great self inquiry. <laughs> wow. so, I was just going to say quickly, Nick, um, Andy, when you're talking, that brought something up with me that's really stuck with me. Um, something that I heard Gary Vee say of uh, a lot of times that voice in your head, that negative voice, isn't yours, right? Mm -hmm. It's been put there by other people, by your parents, by um, people that bullied you, by whoever it might be. But a lot of times, like you're saying, where you don't even know that those, that those dragons aren't yours, you know, that voice sometimes inside is, is those other people's dragons, right? Bringing you down or um, giving you those, those insecurities. Yeah, I really, I really love that, man. That, that voice isn't ours. It's the echoes of the people before us, right? Yeah. yeah. Nuke, did you have anything to add on that? Yeah, so this is, this is a beautiful topic and I love it. <clears throat> I mean, the question, bigger pardon. And for me, what comes up is two things. I've heard my mentor say, what you don't transform from, you transfer to the next generation, whether or not you're aware of it or not. And this is what you're talking about. And case in point, right? If you don't, if you don't learn how to love yourself, all you do is tell your kids subconsciously or consciously, like, you're not good enough. Like, you're not beautiful, da 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 da, -da right? And if that's all that child hears, right? Let's just say from K to what to five or six that's the tape player that is where the, that is where their mind is the most impressionable the soil is the most fertile and you just planted seeds of what you're not good enough no don't do that i don't know like you fill in the blank so what do you think that child is going to have a tape player of as they grow up and unless they're doing things that are constructive and positive and uplifting in their life outside of you, that tape player will follow them through. And, th and that becomes their narrative. Whether or not they're aware of it, that becomes their narrative. So then it becomes so much harder when we're what? In our late 20s, going into our 30s to be like, okay, let me reprogram my nervous system. Let me reprogram 30 years of being told that I'm not good enough. Like, that's a lot of work. So yeah, with parents, it's a big responsibility and, and, mo and mom used to always joke and say like, joking, but, but she'd also be very serious. Like, like, the, like this parenting thing, this adult thing, having kids, being in love, it's, it's, big, it's big boy work, it's adult work. And it is, you know, and from the other book that I read, it was like, <clears throat> I was talking about parenting and it was saying, how many kids are raising kids? You yeah. know, and I, and I read that and I was like, wow. And yes, you can be in your 40s and have a kid. But for all we know, emotionally, spiritually, cognitively, you're still that of a boy or girl psychology. And you now expect to raise a child? Absolute disconnect. What do you think is going to happen? You know, and so basically what they were saying is like, we need to make sure that we are... I will use king and queen verbiage, raising kids, not a boy raising a boy. You're just gonna transfer boy psychology, right? And so, yeah, <laughs> like whatever you don't transform from, you by default will transfer it to your kids. And if it's not, and if it's based in like fear and hurt and shame and pain, 
you're just setting that kid up to have to slay your dragons thinking that they're theirs and it's like that's not i don't, I don't want to say it's not fair that's not responsible yeah. there's a saying and it, it's uh you project onto others what you don't look within yourself i like that i like that a lot yeah, yeah. that's the same it's basically the same thing with the saying different words but you know we have to begin to look in the mirror and look at our stuff and sift through our stuff and ask the right questions. For sure. And something that really stood out for me, Nuke, when you were talking was the idea that kids are actually very intuitive, mm -hmm. right? Is that, you know, a lot of times, you know, subconsciously parents are um, struggling with something and they pass that on to their kids because their kids are so intuitive that they pick up with it. They pick up on it, sorry. However, you know, the intellectual side isn't completely there. So they don't understand what they're picking up on or why they're picking up on it, right? And mm -hmm. so they pick up on something and what they go to is, oh, like, you know, I shouldn't love myself or I'm not loved or I'm not good enough or whatever it might be, because they can pick up that something is wrong, but they're not able to understand where it's coming from. And I think that those are a lot of those lessons that we internalize and they go deep within ourselves and become the truths that we carry into our adulthood because they were learned and decided upon, you know, when we were six, seven, eight, whatever it might be. Andy, do you have something? Yeah, I really, I really, really love what you said there, the things that we pick up without knowing. And I wanted to add that a really common one that, that kids pick up early on is when there's, uh, there's a parent present in the, in the household that is violence or that uses physical force as a form of uh, discipline. And the, you know, the translation in the, in the emotional body for that kid growing up is love is physical force or physical violence. Love hurts. Love has to hurt. That, that's their, you know, the, their mind doesn't get it in the moment, but their body is what is, is receiving that message, right? Is mom and dad love me, but they're also hitting me. So that must be love. Yeah. And that, that actually triggered something for me that I just, I want to share with you guys. Um, and I think I might've shared it before, um, of just an example of this and something that I've had to unravel where, um, so my mom, um, growing up, she always tells us of how she always stood up for people. Right. And she <laughs> would basically go and beat the bully up, whatever it might be. She was this farm girl, um, and just super tough. However, in her mind, that wasn't the way to do it. And she didn't want that for us, right? She didn't want, you know, us to get into fights, us to, you know, have physical confrontation. And so in her mind, um, she said, okay, I'm gonna go about this a different way to save you from that pain. And so when I was getting bullied, when I was very young, um, grade two-ish, you know, I'd come home, I, moved, I just moved to school. And so of course, you know, the new kid and I don't know any of the other kids. So I got bullied and I'd come home and tell her this, right? And her answer was, oh, they actually want to be your friends, right? And that's why they're doing it. They just want to be your friend. So just be nice to them, fill them with kindness, whatever it might be. And I went, okay, like, oh, they want to be my friend. And subconsciously what that told me is when people like me, they treat me badly. And it wasn't until this past year when I was looking back on everything that I started to realize that in a lot of the relationships, friendships, whatever it might be in my life, a lot of people treated me badly and I felt that I needed that for them to like me. When people were overly nice or didn't have that, I went, oh, they don't actually like me because they're not treating me badly. And that was a lesson that I had to understand. Um, so the next one is just going a little bit deeper into that idea of 
you know, the ge how generations have passed things down and continue to pass things down. And again, it's not just your parents, it's what their parents taught them and what their parents' parents taught them and so on and so forth. And I think that a lot of these very strict rules or deep seated ideas come from and you know some of the worst things that are going on and you know even things like racism and um you know very strict unhealthy religious practices around the world whatever it might be is that's just the way that it's done and that are those are the lessons that we have passed on generation to generation and the lessons that need to be unlearned Right. And, you know, that going back to that idea, of, you know, there's a couple of videos around the Internet where, you know, children know love and no matter who it is, you know, those that hatred is taught. And so I just wanted to know or see if you guys had anything to speak on um, on that. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll leave this one. Uh, Jared, great question. I love that. And uh, what comes to mind right away is this idea of what gets talked about in the house gets replicated or duplicated outside the house, you know? And so I think if, if there's a healthy conversation happening within the house, right, that child is only going to replicate and is only going to replicate and duplicate what they hear, what they see with other people. And that's a scary place to be, I think, because then once again, this whole like two tier family, I am your parent, I am God, doesn't give much room for then, you know, Uncle Andy, Uncle Jared, Uncle Sohan and so forth and so on to come in and give their perspective, right? And show all the blind sides that maybe I, as their father, don't see, right? Um, that's, one, that's one part of the question. The other part of that generational stuff, I think as conscious whole people, as we transition from, let's just say, in this case, we're, we're both, we're all men here, from boy psychology to man psychology, we need to do a self audit of the things that we think we know or that have been passed on to us around this is just how we do things and if we don't i feel we're doing a disservice to our higher selves right to our current reality self because how can we be making decisions from the past right like i feel like if we're driving forward how can we be looking back the whole time like that's an absolute disconnect now, that's not to say that we don't take those beautiful, strong virtues, right? And take the meat and the potatoes and leave the bones. And I think for a lot of people, sometimes they're so rigid with that, that there's no willingness to be like, hey, hey, like, just because it's not broke doesn't mean we can't fix it, that it can't be updated, it can't be tweaked, it can't be dropped. And so, yeah, I completely agree with you with regard to some of these rigid religious beliefs are some of these um, tactics that are based in fear, which, which I can acknowledge, hey, back then when we didn't know what we didn't know, it was probably rooted in love and it brought us forward and it made us thrive and survive. Now sitting here in 2020, you know, does it make sense maybe to be having certain ideologies? Probably not, you know? Um, yeah, that's what comes to mind. Yeah, I, um, you know, the, the shift that I think, uh, that, that needs to happen today is in a, in a family dynamic, instead of sitting our kids down and like educating our kids on X, Y, Z, it's, it's more along the lines of creating a culture where there's open dialogue and conversation. Because, again, when they, when they grow up, when they're in their 20s, 30s, 40s, when they start in their own families, 
it's going to be a different generation with different, uh, with, with, with different societal pressures and, and different, and there's going to be a different texture to bullying and, and, and whatnot. And we have to have a conversation about how do we show up in this generation today? Right? So, so the, the thing that I think the priority is to create a culture of dialogue as long as it's rooted in love, truth, and positivity, as Nuke says all the time so well. As long as it's rooted and, and as long as the intention is truth, love, and positivity, let's have a conversation. What is most needed in this time versus this is my way? Because clearly it hasn't worked, right? It, it's, that is um, a late, and I'm going to say it, it's a lazy, uh, it's a lazy approach. It's easier to say, I'm just going to do it this way and I'm going to teach it this way because that's how I was taught. You know, there's no, there's, there's a lack of creative uh, thinking there. And there's also a lack of openness and dialogue. And so that's what I feel. I, I feel like we need to create a culture instead of um, educating. We need to just educating. We have to create a culture of conversation and connection. I love that. And that's a perfect segue um, to the next one. Um, but just really quickly, uh, just some clarification when I was saying um, things like very rigid uh, religious practices and stuff like that, just to expand uh, for everybody to know what I'm talking about. And that's, in my mind, acceptance of things like the LGBTQ plus community, right? That's things like hating another religious group because they are different than you right, and leading to violence, things of that nature. And those are more of the ideas that I was talking about. Um, now, going back to what, just what you were say, saying there, Andy, is I think a lot of times there is a very rigid um, thinking around parents trying to teach their kids, right, of this is what worked for me, or this is the world that I lived in, and so I'm going to say the exact same thing to my children. I'm going to teach the exact same lessons, even though the world is completely different, right? And a lot of those core lessons can be passed on, but if there's no fluidity in, um, you know, in the context of the world that children are living in today, you know, those lessons can become twisted. And, you know, a, a big one for me is, you know, pushing the, idea of what success is right and i find very specifically for a lot of our parents generation is almost everyone i talk to their parents told them find a good job um buy a good house and retire as early as you can right and those are almost the only things that matter and have kind of been beaten in beaten into um, our heads of that's what you do in life. Find a good job, um, get a house, and then you retire. And the pushback, especially on my side, to that is what if I want more, right? What if those aren't, you know, my North Stars? And so I just wanted to see if you guys have experienced anything similar um, and just your overall thoughts on that. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Nuke. Yeah, I grew up uh, I, I grew up in an Asian culture, Asian household, where there were a lot of expectations around how we were educated and what we needed to become. And it was very much of a traditional sense uh, of of what you what you said. So I'm echoing what you said around like get a house, find a partner, get married, uh, find a good job, have a family, and it was it was so linear, so linear. And where I came from, or the family that I came from, they came from war. And so their mentality was, we want the best for the future. Uh, and the best is better than war, however that looks. And, and yeah, like it, it, it is a little bit tough because growing up, there's just these high expectations of getting good grades and going to college, even though even though I didn't know what, what I was going to do, right? It's like, just go to college. You know, just do it, even if you don't know what you're doing. 
And so, you know, it, it was, it was really interesting growing up and I feel like I'm, I'm, I feel fortunate because my mom, she, as I, as I grew up, she relaxed a little bit and the pressures were a lot less and she started adapting more of, she became a Buddhist and she started adapting more of an open energy and open perspective around, Hey, you know what, this is a different generation. Even if I wanted it my way, they still, our kids can still choose otherwise. So her mentality was, I would rather let them like be open and let them figure it out versus have such a tight grasp on them and have them rebel and even, re or even like resent us. And so that was my experience with that. You, what about you? I can resonate with what Andy said word for word. Uh, my parents come from poverty and for my dad to do what he has done was all scholastic. So for him, it was like, we're talking about a man with a PhD doing neuroscience and pharmacology. So for him, it was like, yo, education is the ticket. So go get it. And so, um, we all learned, and when I say we in our family, we all learned very quick. I wasn't <laughs> academically, in, I wasn't academically inclined. And so um, because of that, like, and I've never, I've never gone, <laughs> I've never gone with the grain. I've always gone against the grain. So um, yeah, so like going to school I, and you know what, like, so out of high school, I went to cooking school, which was totally different than everybody in my circle. And then went back and did Kines and, and and I remember I remember one point in time, I I just I was talking to mom and dad and I was like I don't know if I want to do Kines anymore and what have you and we were talking whatever 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 and then I just kind of we were we were we were on the phone and I just told them I was like hey, do you trust that you've raised a good kid? And they're like yeah, and I was like so then what is the issue with me not wanting to do what you want me to do, right? <laughs> and it not looking the way you want to look. And they're like, <laughs> and they both, and, and I could tell they were both kind of like, damn it, we raised, <laughs> we raised a smart kid. Because in that moment I was like, why does it matter whether or not I have a bachelor's degree to my name or a master's or a PhD, right? And, it, and, and I think in that moment, this kind of realized, okay, like he doesn't need, it doesn't need to look the way we want it to look for him to be successful or for him to be happy, you know? And it was cool because in that moment, once again, I just realized my parents are human, you know, and, and they're just doing the best that they know how and they want the best for us so that when they go, they know that we did everything in our power to set this man up for success. And they're just able and being able to have that conversation with them is like, okay, like I get it. I get where you're coming from and I will do what I can to be successful in my own right. And I will honor you and stand on your shoulders and see more and do more. It just won't look the way you want it to look. Now, Nuke, like that's amazing. <laughs> I want to, I want to ask though, can you try to go one step deeper on, I think a lot of people, would go there's no way in hell I'm, I'm saying that to my parents so there's a lot of fear in yeah. that with their parents um you know in that way in a loving way at the same time but still like i don't know what's called like disobeying or uh, mm -hmm. standing up for yourself can you go one step deeper on was it yeah. a big struggle getting to that point was it um you know was it something that you thought about a lot or was it just naturally like that's how you felt and you're able to articulate that to them so once again i'm gonna give kudos to my parents because i remember i remember when i so i i've been i've i moved away when i was 18 and left my mom my mom and dad were in kuwait and i went i came back to canada and dad dad told me three things when i left he was like don't do anything to embarrass me or this family always do your best. You make your bed, you sleep in it. So with that in mind, it was like, okay, I will forge my path. 
right? And 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 like and in that moment, it clued into me like he was saying, "You do whatever you need to do to be successful." That's how I took it. And so in that moment, I was allowed to do whatever I wanted. Granted, of course, keeping those three things in mind. And so obviously, their perspective of like finish school, what are you doing with your life, always came up. And it was in that moment that I was like, hey, I don't know if it's going to look the way you guys want it to look, you know? And, and, it, and it was just coming to that place of like a conversation and dialogue of like, hey, why do you guys need it to look this way? Right? Like, like that was it. Like, like, why does it have to look this way? And then being like, well, because, so I was like, okay, cool. I get that. Why? Like, why else? Well, because we just want to make sure that you're taken care of and Okay, cool. And then it was in that moment that I was like, okay, so if I'm like, if I'm sane and I'm happy and I'm healthy and I'm not breaking any of God's laws or man's laws, whoever God you choose, what is the problem then? You know what I mean? And, it, and, and, and for them, I think it was just even like, okay, you're right. Like we are putting false expectations on you. We, we are putting pressures on you that aren't maybe realistic and and yeah they, they just became a lot more chill so much more chill and they just dialed it back and and i and i always joke with my dad i'm like dude like your windows 98 <laughs> we're like <laughs> and like my sister and i we're like max nothing against windows 98 and max but i was just like dude like your mindset and your, and ideology is great and is a great foundation but it, it may not work right or not work. It's not going to be as compatible or streamlined. Back then, 100%. High fives, butt taps, it worked. 20, sitting here in 2020, it's going to have to shift. It's going to look different. And in case in point, what you said originally with reimagining what success could look like. What does joy look like? What does happiness look like? And those look like two different constructs if we're looking at, like, let's say, the West and the rest of the world, you know? So hopefully I went a layer deeper. Thank you. No, that, that helps a ton. Andy? Yeah, I'll even go a layer deeper too. <laughs> um, so I want to speak to anybody who's listening to this podcast right now and feeling like there's, there's just no way my parents could ever receive something like that. Like I, I just can't uh, go there. And the one thing that I wanted to pass on uh, to those people because the, the, the reality is not all of our parents are going to be ready to receive that type of dialogue or even have that conversation. And so the question then is, what then? What then, right? And, and for me, uh, the first thing that comes to me is, and it's a principle that I actually live by, and I started living this by this principle for the last year and a half, two years. And the principle is you have to be okay with being mis misunderstood. Because if we live our entire lives uh, pleasing others, because that's kind of where it's rooted from. I got to please mom and dad because they're on the pedestal, right? I got to please them or they'll, they'll shame me or I'll let the family down. And so the, the question is, you know, are you willing to go there? Uh, are you willing to live on your edge and be misunderstood? And that's such a crucial, that, for me, that was such a crucial turning point. Uh, not just with my, my mom and, and the people that grew up with me, but my peers as well in present day is I can show up fully, truthfully, authentically, um, rooted in truth and, and speak my voice and risk being misunderstood, risk being misunderstood. And when I began to live out that principle on a consistent basis, I regained my personal power and it, when you regain your personal power, you can do, you can do anything. You can go, you can go the, the, the extra mile and a lot of different things. Because usually so, so many parts of us want to go that extra mile. However, the one thing that holds us back is, well, what if this person gets mad? Or, well, what if I lose that friend? Or, well, what if, you see what I mean? And so the question is, what if you're, what if it's okay to be misunderstood? Yeah, I love that. And quickly before I go to Nuke, um, just what it brought up for me was being willing 
to accept that short-term pain, that short-term pain of being misunderstood, of having a disagreement with, with peers or parents, whatever it might be, for that long-term gain of happiness, of you know, being living, living in your truth, right? And living on, on your own two feet and, you know, um, by your standards and by what's important to you. Nuke? Andy, love that. And likewise, Jared. And to parallel what Andy just told you all that are listening, um, anytime you go against the grain in anything, you're going to get backlash. Doesn't matter what it is. So just be mindful of that, right? And with regard to your parents, if you can't, <laughs> I'm not saying that you go and tell them, hey, I'm not doing what you want. No, if anything, you just lead by example. You lead by example, and guess what? You show up day in and day out and execute, and guess what? You will tell them indirectly that, hey, like, I am successful, I am happy. And they will slowly but surely catch on. It is a marinating process. It is a crock pot. It is not a microwave solution. So you lead by example and do exactly what Andy communicated day in and day out. And if they, if they truly love you, and I'm sure they do, you will slowly convert them. So Amazing. I love that microwave uh, crock pot analogy too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just really quickly going back to, to something that was said, um, is again, bringing that empathy back to your parents of realizing sometimes they were born into a really bad situation, right? Which can look like extreme poverty, which can look like war, right? Like extreme things. And a lot of those lessons that they learned were survival. They needed to learn those to survive. And you can empathize with that. You can understand that. However, that doesn't mean that those lessons still apply to you, right? Um, and then just finally, one thing very specifically that came up that I've pushed against is the idea that my parents say all the time, which is, well, you shouldn't enjoy work, right? Like work is always work. You're always going to hate work. Right. And really pushing against that of, well, no, I want to do something that I enjoy. Right. If I don't enjoy it, I don't want to be doing it. And um, yeah, so that was a, just a very specific example from my life that um, I pushed against and from a young age for no reason at all, just knowing that it did not sit right with me and um, just not accepting it. So um, the next one that I just want to get into quickly here is you know, if people might be asking, well, why not like work on fixing our parents, right? And I use that, that term loosely of fix, right? But why not work on, fo uh, you know, focus on fixing them. And when I've thought about it is, and why I go to like breaking the chain and working on yourself instead is because then you can affect every generation below you. Right. If you're able to, to better yourself and realize these things, be conscious of these things and slay your own dragons, help your children slay their dragons. Um, they can then become better people and pass it on to their children and so on and so forth. Um, the other aspect is a lot of a lot of the one you have complete control over yourself. Right? If you're willing to do the work, you can control that. Um, however, when you're trying to you know, work on someone else, they have to be open to it. And you can bang your head against the wall as many times as you want, but if they're not open to it, you know, you're not gonna make that same progress if any. Right? And two, you know, it's just to be honest, a lot harder work because they've been set in these ways for decades longer than you have. Right. And three, it will make your life better and bettering yourself will most likely affect them in a positive way. And um, yeah, I just I wanted to open that up to, to see if you guys had anything to add onto that. Yes. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I, you, you touched on it a little bit already, but it was around you cannot help someone who isn't willing, right? Uh, that's one point, that's one thought that came up for me. The other thought that came up for me was, if we're trying to change them, then it's, it isn't really about them, is it? It's about what we want. And so, it, you know, you really have to like think about that for a second, right? Is if we want them to change or we want to fix them so badly, it's, it's not about them, it's really about us. Uh, and so I would say, you know, one of the things that came out of the last Kings of Hearts uh, online event, because it was about fatherhood, and the two words that came out for me, that stood out for me was radical acceptance, is to love them as they are, and that is the fertile ground where, which they will flourish and grow in. You know, changing somebody is, it's, it's, it sounds so controlling, it sounds so manipulative, I have to change them. And you know, in reality is that people change whether we want to change them or not. People are changing all the time as we grow, as we age, as we experience many things in our lives. And so if people are, if people are already changing, what's there, to, what's there to change, right? We have to relinquish a little bit of our ego in that sense, I believe. And I believe the opposite of ego is surrender, is to just, you know, surrender to the situation and just lead by example. Love that. Mm -hmm. Nick, what about you? Jared, I love everything that you said in your preface that I completely agree. And what Andy said, <laughs> so good. Um, for me, it's, yeah, you, you be the change you want to see, be the change you want to see, right? And that will have a cascading effect. Generations above you and generations below you. And lastly, for me, the biggest thing that I'm realizing as I'm getting more mature, not older, is <laughs> that in every dynamic, there's an opportunity to be a leader or a teacher and a student. And I think a lot of the time when we're with our parents, we always think that because they're our parents and they're older, they're always the teacher. However, what I'm learning is guess what? they can still be in a boy psychology or girl psychology. So in those moments, guess what? Me being conscious and aware and healthy and whole, I will be the leader now. And I will, as, as Andy, you always gut checks me. I will go on one knee, right? Metaphorically, and be like, hey, where's this coming from? Why are you acting like that? Is there something you want to tell me? Do you see what I'm saying? And if you can meet them with this kind of, this curiosity and compassion and grace, one, they're not on a pedestal and you see the child in them. And you see like, guess what? Probably if they grew up and let's say object poverty or in a war situation or in a not healthy household, you just realize like, guess what? They are still a child and they haven't matured past what? Five, six years old. And that's all the nervous system knows. So now, us three kings sitting here, having this conversation, when our parents blow up at us and tell us like, you're not good enough and did it. You don't meet fire with fire, right? You just sit there graciously and you, you, you and it, to me it almost becomes comical. And you're like, yes, I prepared for this. Hey dad, where's that coming from? And you probably just watch his shoulders drop and be like, I, I don't know, like, you know what I mean? And if you just meet them with curiosity, and compassion, you're actually giving them now an opportunity to almost start self-critiquing why they say what they say. And even if it doesn't happen the first time, you keep coming down on one knee and be like, hey, you know I love you, right? I see you, and it's okay, and I got you. And I'm sure slowly but surely, you just start becoming the adult, the, not even the adult, you start leading the conversation, you start leading the way. And to me, it, I like, it's, it's moments like that where it's just like, okay, like this generational trauma breaking in the chain and what have you, that's how you slowly but surely break it. I don't even know if I answered your question, dog, but that's what came up for me. <laughs> it was beautiful either way, love it. Um, 
it, so as we wrap up here, is there anything either of you guys would like to like to say, like to touch on? Hmm. Hmm. I stroke my chin here while we think. <laughs> I think I, think, uh, I feel pretty complete. Too. Okay, what I want to say is I really loved what Andy said around creating a culture around conversation and dialogue. I think that's what needs, that's a huge thing. And, yeah. and it's definitely something that I can say for myself, I know, yeah, I know for Andy, it's all about conversation and dialogue, hence King of Hearts of just being like, let's get it all out on the table. And then from there, hey, you know, like, let's get it all out on the table. You speak your truth, I speak mine. And then where can we find common ground and move forward together? Yeah. And it's not just a one-time thing. It's a continual, right? Pivoting, addressing, recalibrating, retweaking the whole time. So that'd be yeah. my advice. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Putting everything in the light, right? You know, putting it all out on the table, not keeping it in the shadows and, you know, trying to use it as an ulterior motive, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love that. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you so much to both of you. Um, this is an idea that I've really been throwing around a lot lately and I'm still figuring it out. And um, it's something that's very important to me um, because I think that it can be one of the most impactful ways and ideas of my life um, and can affect people long after I'm gone. And so thank you both. Um, I'll probably be revisiting it in the future as I wrap my head around it more. But um, thank you for being part of this conversation. Um, I love you both and just appreciate you so much. Love you too, homie. <laughs> as always.